hanging around for me here. Um, this is, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, lecturing to your group. I've had a tremendous number of, of positive feedback and great questions last a uh, couple of weeks on the lectures I've given. So this is this is the, the last in my series. I had a little three-part series on prescribing. Um, uh, as I said last time, the, there we as an optometry profession, um, our ability to use lenses and prisms and filters is part of what makes us unique. We do things no other profession is able to do. And as a result, we help a lot of patients that just don't get help elsewhere for their, their vision problems. Um, I, I, this, is, this was a lecture I, I put together. Um, uh, uh, what I say about astigmatism is everybody complains about astigmatism, but nobody does anything about it. So uh, a little bit of a joke there. Um, and uh, we actually already had some questions last week at my, my talk on pediatric prescribing, people were asking about high cylinders and how to handle them. So, um, so I think this lecture really uh, follows up well with uh, the last one, because uh, again, a lot of these children um, come in with uh, uh, interesting prescriptions uh, and, uh, and they have not been successful or many of them have not had lenses before from other doctors. So, um, uh, they come to us and we have to figure out how to make this patient operate the best. So, so uh, there'll be, there'll be a lot of uh, fun pearls here. Okay. So um, the goals of this course, uh, you know, I don't know if we really understand exactly why people develop astigmatism, but we'll talk about the theories um, uh, of why people develop astigmatism. Uh, We'll talk about advantages and disadvantages of astigmatism. Like very often, uh, functional astigmatism, it, it's, it's developed because there's some sort of benefit to the organism, like the development of, uh, of myopia, which is a whole nother uh, lecture or lectures. Um, uh, there, there is an advantage to being myopic in terms of reducing near point stress um, what is the advantage of developing astigmatism? So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about various options out there for treatment. And, and I'm really going to be, I'm gonna be talking, I got, a, I got a bunch of rules here on uh, prescribing for astigmatism. And I, I find them to be very handy. I don't always <laughs> listen to my own rules. Um, some of them are my own, some of them are, are from uh, other doctors and other papers that have been published, but we'll talk about treatment options here. So, you know, optically, uh, you know, we all, as optometrists, we've all spent a lot of time learning optics here. And uh, this is a really nice diagram where we have one meridian here. This is the vertical meridian, and then we have the horizontal meridian. And when the point focus for these different meridians is not in the same place. This is obviously a high degree where, where one meridian is coming to a focus in front of the retina and one is behind the retina. But it's a reflection of one, the, this meridian here, the blue meridian, having much more curvature to it, uh, is going to uh, be functioned more here. Uh, more in front of the retina and the other one more behind. Of course, they could both be in front, they could both be in, in behind as well. And uh, so when the two meridians are, when you do not have a spherical uh, cornea here, uh, where the both horizontal, where, where all the meridians come to one place, this is the definition of astigmatism. It always, it always has, a, it's a terrible term, it drives people nuts. Um, Parents think it's something very serious. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this here as we go by. So, um, so, so I was trying to, when I was researching this, I did try to find a lot in the literature here uh, as far as the history of astigmatism. Obviously, astigmatism has always been with us, but the awareness of astigmatism is really something very recent, okay? Uh, the, the first papers, uh, that were published were by Thomas Young. He described uh, um, the uh, uh, irregularity of, uh, of focus here, um, the, the non-spherical uh, condition. He was the first to describe it. And shortly thereafter in 1825, 
uh, the Reverend uh, Goodrich said, uh, was, uh, was quoted as saying, my eyes require a glass whose shape does not correspond to a portion of a true sphere, but rather to a portion of a spheroid or perhaps a cylinder. So um, this was uh, the oldest time uh, usage of the word cylinder, which is now here, which uh, uh, I spelt, there's, there's uh, an extra spelling here. Sorry, that's a typo. I didn't catch that, gosh. Anyway, perhaps to a cylinder. And of course, uh, we're getting into the age of astronomy here in the 1800s. And uh, Airy was the, the first to correct his astigmatism with a uh, sphero cylinder lens. Of course, uh, you know, the great lens makers were, were the, uh, the people who were grinding lenses for, for telescopes and binoculars and other instruments. Um, uh, shortly thereafter, 1849, Stokes described uh, something he called a rotary cylinder, which is very similar to the Jackson cross cylinder that we use. And uh, eight, by 1860, Helmholtz, uh, you know, a great name in, uh, in optometry and optics, uh, measured, was figured out ways to measure his own astigmatism. And this was other people happening, doing this at the same time. I don't know about you, I talk about this with my friend, uh, my good friend, Dr. John Pulaski of Connecticut, that there always seems to be periods of time where multiple people discover the same thing within a, a, couple, a short period of each other. It's sort of like the, the knowledge base of the time and the instruments available at the time allow multiple people to to come up with the same findings. So Helmholtz measured it, but others did too. And, uh, and now we're getting more into the age of modern optometry here. Uh, uh, 1866, John Glean, uh, Green uh, uh, published the, the, uh, the use of the clock dial as a way of measuring and correcting astigmatism. And uh, as far as actual symptom treatment um, in 1876, uh, Mitchell proposed, uh, was able to use a cylindrical, spherocylindrical lens to reduce his headaches. He was a chronic headache sufferer, and uh, he had measured his astigmatism, and when it was corrected, his headaches uh, went away, which is something we see happen all the time. And uh, then Jackson of the Jackson Cross Cylinder wrote a paper where he described the use of the Jackson Cross Cylinder um, to uh, measure um, amounts of uh, stigmatism. Here's really a, a, a more detailed diagram of what happens when there is cylindrical power, when there is uh, the, uh, 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 the type of, obviously uh, we talked about optical aberrations and astigmatism is an optical aberration. So when you have astigmatism present, how does that light move from uh, the point source that you're looking at to the, uh, the image on uh, the retina. So, and you'll see here, so we have, uh, uh, we have our different meridians here and they're just getting all spread out. There, there is no astigmatism means without point A is without stigma means point. And you see, um, once you get through this cylindrical lens, spherocylindrical lens, there is no place here at all where any of the light comes to a point focus. There is no way to get both meridians 90 degrees apart in the same place. The closest we have is something called the circle of least confusion. Uh, but that again is a, spero, a, a, a spero, spherical equivalent that gets you closest to a point, but we really don't have a point. You still have differences in where the two meridians are, and you have, uh, uh, and then you have your your point where things get focused, which uh, could be the retina or or screen if you're projecting. And here's our clock dial again. If you have uh, astigmatism, um, the lines are going to be darker one way and lighter the other way, depending on whether you have it still at 90, which is uh, our against the rule um, astigmatism, and 180, which is our with the rule astigmatism. So, and of course, everything in between. And this is a popular way for refracting people, if, especially if you don't have access to a, uh, a cross cylinder. This is something that's really controversial here. 
there was a, 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 a Renaissance artist named El Greco and all his, all his uh, paintings uh, had a very vertical, you know, uh, against the rule kind of stretch to thing. Everything was stretched in a vertical fashion. And it's uh, still debated to this day, was that cause he had a high amount of astigmatism and everything looked to be elongated vertically to him? Or was this just a stylistic trademark of his way of doing things? So this, this gets debated to this day. Obviously he was, uh, this painting is, is 1599. So El Greco is not around anymore to, uh, to tell us what, he's, uh, what he saw. But uh, you could argue it both ways. It's kind of a philosophical um, argument amongst Renaissance uh, painting experts. So I mentioned this briefly, what astigmatism is without point. It's a, a visual defect. And with the unequal curvature of one or more refractive surfaces of the eye, usually the cornea, prevents light from focusing clearly at one particular point on the retina, resulting in uh, a blurred optical image and blurred vision. So, um, and we spend a lot of our, our refractive portion of the exam measuring and uh, using lenses to correct it. So uh, the prevalence is, uh, prevalence is pretty high when, depending, depending on what you read, uh, okay. Um, it's in the literature from as little as seven and a half percent to as much as 75 percent in the the general population. So it depends on what people consider that baseline for astigmatism. Does a quarter of sill count as somebody having astigmatism or not? Obviously, to come up with a number like 75 percent, you have to include even minute amounts of uh, cylinder. Uh, but if you're going to use a baseline um, of like a half diopter, which is pretty you know, common, then you, you're probably gonna find about half your patients. The literature says it's probably about 50% of your patients have a uh, half diopter or more of sill. 10% have at least a diopter or more and 8% have uh, over a diopter and a half, over a diopter and a half. So, uh, so the question always becomes, you know, we'll talk about it. What's a, what is a significant amount of cylinder and when should we start prescribing for it? So uh, I said, it's a terrible term. This is, I don't, I have no idea how well this joke <laughs> translates, uh, but uh, um, this is a cartoon you know, called Agnes and uh, the teacher in class says, uh oh, oh the, she's at the uh, optometrist office. You could see she's got a sign here. She's getting her eyes examined. And in the upper right corner of the first box, it says optometrist. And she goes, you have severe, a severe astigmatism. And he goes, no, no, no. I am too young to be marked a saint. I have all manner of unruliness to perform, empty calories to enjoy, insolence to perfect. No, no, no. And then the, the optometrist says, no, no, no. You have astigmatism, not, uh, not stigmata, which is, uh, 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 and she goes, shoot, there goes my holy card. Stigmata is, you know, the, the, uh, the wounds and the, hands and feet of, uh, of uh, Jesus when he was uh, crucified. So it has a, uh, a religious tone to it. But uh, so I thought it's pretty funny. Usually I get something different. Usually um, uh, there, there's a, uh, if you're from New York, especially from the New York City area, I'll just tell one more story. When, if you're from the New York City area, you, you have to whisper serious illnesses. So uh, I, somebody will come in and say, oh, my husband has astigmatism. And so I know immediately they're from the New York City area because they whisper uh, what is perceived as a serious illness. And I, I know uh, somebody has moved to my area from that part of New York when they go, oh yeah, my child has astigmatism. Then I know I know that they're 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 serious about it. So, if they whisper serious illnesses, they're from the New York City area. So anyway, it's a joke. I don't know how well it translates. If not, you know, I'll take it out next time I speak to to you people. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about the models of uh, of uh, astigmatism. Uh, there is definitely uh, some cases where there's genetic uh, predetermination. 
Um, I find especially some of these um, higher amounts, I'll have families where everybody is like a minus four at 180 and uh, the father comes in and the grandfather comes in and they all have this high amount of, uh, of astigmatism. So uh, um, it's not, so there definitely are people where it's a genetic tendency. Uh, I think I'll lump in with that uh, um, uh, certain genetic conditions like as Down syndrome. We talked a little bit about that last week, where if you're doing a lot of kids with developmental issues, you're going to come across kids with high degrees of, of, uh, of cylinder. You'll get three, four, six uh, degrees of, uh, of cylinder. And uh, um, I just had one the other week that was, I think, seven seven uh, diopters of cylinder and we had to, I don't know about which kind of foropter you're using, but I actually have to plug in when it gets above six, I have to have to put in this auxiliary lens in my foropter. So I don't know if the, uh, the newer foropters go up higher than that, but I have to always open up my draw and pull out those two minus two cylinders that, that extend my cylinder range up to eight. And, uh, um, uh, uh, so, and it plugs into my fropter, it snaps in and I take it out. So, uh, so I had, I had a kid, uh, two weeks ago that had about seven, seven and a half diopters of, of astigmatism. And we had to, to use those lenses. Um, one, uh, model also is lid tension. This is, um, thought to be why people develop more, uh, against the rule cylinder, uh, as they get older. Again, if you're, your lids are exerting very small amount of pressure on your uh, eyelids that there is an effect on the uh, one of the meridians to become more myopic. And as you get older, your lids become more flaccid and the tone decreases. So, um, so changes in lid tension will result in, in more cylinder as the uh, patient gets older. Um, treatment. Uh, and and uh, the treatment uh, obviously is usually lenses, uh, lenses or contact lenses. Obviously, is our, our main treatment for them. There are some surgeries out there. Um, I'll mention it a little later what what it is. But uh, um, we you know nowadays people as part of uh, if they're especially on the myopic end, uh, treatment with uh, LASIK may be something. And of course, we also have pathologic. Uh, forms of astigmatism. If somebody has keratoconus, the first sign that they may have keratoconus might be a, an increase in cylinder over a fairly short period of time. And uh, there's obviously different types of genetic uh, uh, types of uh, keratoconus, some more uh, progressive than others. And uh, nowadays with the uh, improvement of technology of scleral lenses, we're able to maintain much uh, more crisp uh, vision in keratoconic patients than we used to in the past when uh, we really were limited to uh, uh, conventional uh, RGP lenses and uh, even some of the soft uh, cylindrical lenses. So um, that's a whole nother talk for somebody else who's much more into contact lenses than me, but uh, um, we need to, being that we're talking about astigmatism, we need to mention times when uh, stigmatism can really become a problem. So, and definitely I, I you know, keratoconic, I've had siblings come in with, uh, with keratoconus, keratoconus of different degrees. And uh, so that's also has its own genetic pathway. Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the other writings. Uh, Forrest, and by the way, this is, uh, I may have mentioned this book last week, but this is one of my favorite books is, is Stress and Vision by Elliot Forrest. And uh, he, uh, he talks a lot about, actually the book talks a lot about everything, but uh, when I was uh, researching uh, astigmatism, he referred to it as marinional myopia. And this is the development of myopia in one meridian only as a result of the change in head and eye movement patterns. So when we're doing different things, you can be a head mover, you could be an eye scanner, you could have a vertical predominance of head versus eyes, you could have a vertical predominance of head over eyes. So obviously, 
you need a combination of vertical and horizontal movements to work your way across the printed page and to get from the top to bottom of, of the page. And he talks about horizontal or with the rule of stigmatism, cylinder at 180, uh, minus cylinder at 180. Hopefully we're all on the same page there. Uh, horizontal astigmatism being seen in lateral eye movements for side to side and head movements for up and down, as opposed to vertical or sill at 90, minus sill at 90 astigmatism against the rule seen in those who favor head movements for looking side to side and eye movements for scanning up and down. So, um, and it, so that's what we're talking about here. And this is in stress and vision. And again, it's just a model. Uh, again, we tend uh, to see the patients already after they've developed it. So it's tough for us to predict who's going to develop it. And uh, uh, also we, we need to start thinking in terms, we'll talk a little later, um, people that children are now spending tremendous number of hours during their formative years on computers and how are we moving heads and eyes and are we going to start seeing more people with uh, astigmatism as opposed to just my, just myopia as well. Um, Harmon, uh, Daryl Harmon, uh, one of the great minds of uh, the 1950s, uh, really um, his writings, besides being very difficult to read, um, uh, his writings just have tremendous, like Forrest, um, there's almost more in there than you think. You have to read some of these things two and three times to get everything out of it. So um, he wrote, uh, this was his writing in 1958, Notes on a Dynamic Model of Vision, excuse me. And Harmon, as you know, was very much into posture and balance and movement and, uh, and, <coughs> and ergonomics. And he talked about astigmatism as a maladaptation resulting when the individual combines forward and backward head tilts with superior or inferior convergence. And this results in cyclotorsions, which result in astigmatism. Okay, so we talked about as we converge, as we move up and down while converging, which is something you do when you're moving down a printed page or down a computer screen, that again, we don't just converge in and out. There's also cyclo rotations as we move in and out, because we know those obliques especially do not insert regularly into the globes, that there is almost always some sort of cyclo torsion as we read. And uh, this was uh, uh, thought to be one of the uh, reasons we have computer, so many symptoms on computers as well, because normally when you read, you're moving your eyes more in a V pattern, you look down and in, and that allows you, that compensates and reduces the effect of the cyclotorsion. Whereas on more in a computer, you're looking at something that's almost at eye level. So you're not really moving in a V pattern, you're just moving in and out. And that makes the cyclotorsions more of an issue for you because uh, you're, you're getting away from that natural V pattern of, of convergence that happens when you're reading. So, um, so we talked about the cyclotorsions and, and they've actually done studies. I, again, I, I think I mentioned this last week, um, now that they have all these fancy new topographers, um, that they actually can measure changes in corneal curvature. And again, cornea is where most of our cylinder is. And uh, that when you converge, when you converge and accommodate, they actually are measuring changes in corneal curvature. So um, uh, eventually these brief, uh, uh, as this is again, structure following function. So, eventually these uh, new patterns of convergence and torsion and pulling and tugging of the, uh, the retina result in changes of corneal curvature that are permanent uh, or progressive. And, uh, and you end up with uh, astigmatism. And uh, Harmon also, again, like, uh, um, like Forrest, uh, 
he said astigmatism can be caused or aggravated by adaptations to bodily stress. So uh, again, um, stresses in one part of the body show up elsewhere. So if you have a problem with a hip and you're twisted to one side, you're going to have to move another part of your body elsewhere to, uh, to compensate for it so you don't just fall over to one side. So you end up with these uh, torqued, torqued or twisted symptoms, systems that uh, have all sorts of issues. And uh, um, we always talk about, you know, from a behavioral optometry point of view, um, how these conditions are head to toe issues. And I find that uh, when we're trying to reduce somebody's prescription, somebody's coming in for some myopia or prescription reduction, that uh, a cylinder is much harder to get rid of than, uh, than low minus prescriptions. We'll do some, we do some myopia reduction work, very functional, very uh, holistic. Um, and, uh, but cylinder, I used to tell my patients, cylinder is kind of in your bones. It's, it's really gets embedded in there. And, and it's, it's a, a warpage that your body really adapts to well, like myopia, and it, it is tough to get rid of. And we'll talk about, you know, methods of, of treating it as well. So, uh, but if you can read some of these Harmon notes, uh, again, I think the, uh, the Educated Classroom is really, really good book in terms of ergonomics, but this is one of his, uh, his papers, <clears throat> the dynamic model, notes on a dynamic model of vision. I think it's available through OEP. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. You can only handle so much of it at any one time. John Streff uh, talked about astigmatism uh, having advantages uh, that it allows you, the individual, to be in two points in space at the same time. So somebody who's, well, we'll, we'll simplify it, somebody who's plano minus two at axis 90, well, one meridian is at far and allows them, the child, to see the blackboard, and the other meridian is at two diopters, so half a meter, so that enables them to function at near. Wow, that's almost like, almost like a monovision type of patient. It's like, it's like a unilateral monovision, where instead of having one eye for far and one eye for near, you have one meridian for far and one meridian for near. And uh, it could be at either 90 or at 180, but uh, this tends to be most of the, most of the time, these are our cylinder at, at, at 90 patients who've developed this as an adaptation. And uh, very often we see small amounts of uh, cylinder at 90 to be a precursor to myopia as well. So uh, this is something you need to take into account as far as how often you want patients to return for visits. So again, yeah, this, these, these, this, uh, uh, these kids have to be able to see in two places all the time. They have to be able to see the blackboard. They got to be able to see the desk. And no, myopia is one particular adaptation. Uh, cylinder is another functional adaptation as well. So, um, so there is actually an advantage to it. And we'll talk about what happens uh, when you take that away from them and it, it affects their adaptations. So uh, let's talk about treatments of astigmatism. Um, obviously, what we do most, and we do this day in and day out all the time, um, is of course optical correction um, with uh, glasses or contact lenses. So um, this is we do this all the time. We don't, and most of the time, we don't even think about it. We we refract somebody. They're minus two, minus one at eighty five, and and we just. We just, we, we just prescribe it. it. gives them nice, crisp 20-20 vision and uh, um, they're happy and uh, they can see the board and, and, and mom thinks you're wonderful uh, that you've, uh, you've corrected the, uh, the, the child's vision uh, much the way you would correct their myopia. Um, so, um, and glasses, of course, are easy and generally well-tolerated. And uh, um, we also have toric contact lenses. Okay, so... Um, 
at some point you make it have to make a decision is this worth correcting the sill or not obviously if it's corneal um, many of the uh, soft contact lenses for a diopter or less may mask it or if you prescribe to spherical lenses and try to get that circle of least confusion with the maximum amount of acuity and maximum amount of comfort and range, um, you, you very, by and large, will end up with a happy patient. Uh, at some point, you have to uh, go to a, a, a stigmatic lens, a toric contact lens. Um, you may do that depending on what they need to do. For, some, for instance, if somebody is an athlete and they have to hit a ball, we play baseball here. I don't know if you play cricket over there. <laughs> but uh, um, but obviously, uh, if if athletics are a concern, um, you might push more um, to go for a toric lens. Um, if the person has more complaints, headaches, etc., uh, you might uh, even on low to moderate sills may want to consider doing that. And uh, there is no rule. Uh, as far as also, uh, we'll talk about prescribing in a minute. You know, well, there are some rules to when you should start prescribing, but they're not hard and fast. Um, there are surgeries out there. Um, there. There are surgical procedures, um, some of them laser, some of them others, like LASIK. When it originally, I'm old enough to remember when LASIK first came out and they could only correct spherically. And now I think they routinely do cylinders all the time. Um, I'm not sure, I don't see a ton of LASIK patients these days because my population is so pediatric, uh, but they are, they are doing it. I'm not sure how high they can go with, uh, with a, a LASIK procedure on SIL. Um, but uh, again, we've also seen people get toric IOLs. So um, there are, are patients who, uh, who have, a, 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 and obviously that, that it requires a little more surgical expertise because the orientation of the lens uh, uh, is important. And uh, then there are these corneal inserts that have been written about where uh, you will put them again at 90, at, at 90, uh, at zero and 180 or at 90 and uh, the, the opposing meridian. And so there, there are some people who have done these corneal inserts uh, again, surgically, I think LASIK probably more than anything is, is the, uh, the choice there. Um, and of course, uh, I'm not even going to get into um, uh, ortho-K. Ortho-K is a hot topic now, and uh, you'll need, I don't do ortho-K, so I'm not an expert on that. But uh, obviously, you're trying to uh, sphericalize the cornea as best you can. So, uh, uh, an expert on uh, uh, on ortho K lenses will probably feel comfortable up to a couple of diopters of uh, of cylinder being able to take care of it with uh, the lenses and get some good acuity for when the lenses are out. And uh, we're vision therapists. Uh, I mean, uh, we we try to improve function. These are often functional problems that have become structural, and so we're looking for a uh, functional way to reduce it. Um, I've tried to put things together. There, there's really very, very, very little in the literature of, uh, of using vision therapy to treat astigmatism. There, there's a little more about myopia, but uh, this was, I was really scraping to find things here. So um, these are things from uh, Forrest's book and a couple of other sources. And uh, the real emphasis on eye stretches, especially with movements of the eye in the direction of the habitual head movements. So again, it's assuming that this is kind of a repetitive motion uh, warpage and that you're trying to stretch things out and get the uh, tone and stretching on an effect on the cornea to be as symmetrical 360 degrees as possible and, and to, uh, to, to get things working in a more efficient way. So we will do, we do tons of eye stretches. So um, there's a few ways to do it. If anybody's taking the OEP courses, there's the famous eye control 
where they'll go in all four quadrants and do that, you know, where you're feeling just a little bit of strain and you could do that to a metronome or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do something called uh, face trace where, where we actually have them draw a circle around their face and really try to keep their eyes looking at the tip of the thumb all the way around, nice and slow, nice and slow, coming up to the other side and top. And we really wanna emphasize looking at it with both eyes. So you can look at it, I'm gonna get a little closer to my camera. You can look at it with one eye or you can look at it with both eyes. We wanna emphasize that this is a binocular issue and you're trying to keep both eyes uh, on the target. And we will do nice slow rotations. We'll have them do that three times in each direction, two to three times a day even. And, and we'll warn them that this is gonna hurt the first few days. This is not gonna be a lot of fun. They're gonna, they may get a headache the first time they do that. And they might have to build up to three times in each direction. Uh, again, these are um, people that have very deeply embedded scanning habits and we're trying to break their habits and get them really more flexible and pliable so that we could uh, reduce the astigmatism. Um, similar therapy also just, it's a lot of the same techniques as working with myopia. Again, this is considered a stress induced uh, issue and we do tons and tons of peripheral awareness um, with or without syntonics. Uh, we'll do a lot of central peripheral awareness uh, figure groundwork, um, stress reduction, breathing, blinking, uh, nutritional considerations as well. Uh, ben Lane used to write that, uh, again, uh, there were shortages in calcium and other nutri nutrients um, and, uh, and that we needed to provide supplements for them. So um, again, a lot of these are, are theories uh, of how best to handle these things. So again, um, uh, I also did this, uh, I did some work on myself and because uh, I had a few myopia reduction patients, not astigmatism reduction, but I did some my myopia reduction patients. And I said, I, I felt inadequate to treat them if I hadn't experienced it myself. So again, you don't have to do everything yourself, but I, I felt ignorant of it and what I could expect. So. Um, I've been able to reduce my myopia and my astigmatism um, quite a bit by doing a syntonics and vision therapy on myself uh, and, uh, and walking around with a, a lens that reduced my acuity to about 20, 30 to 20, 40. And eventually now on a good day, if I breathe and blink, it is 20, 20. Uh, but I reduced my sphere from 350 minus 350 to 275. And I reduced my cylinder from about 150 to about somewhere between 50 and 75. So um, I reduced my cylinder on my own. A lot of it, I did I did a lot of syntonics in the beginning. I did a lot of work with uh, yoke prisms. Um, and I really, I really like prisms in the therapy room. That, that's another talk. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of movement activities, stretches, uh, uh, primitive reflex work, and a lot, a lot, a lot of stretches. And uh, I, what I ended up doing is whenever I was doing therapy with a patient, um, I would actually do therapy with them. If they're working on vectograms, I would put on some Polaroid and I would do therapy alongside my patient. Not always, they're not, not always being aware of it. They just think I want to see what they see, but I was actually doing therapy on myself. So uh, just my own story was uh, I tried to go cold turkey one day and I made up a pair of spherical lenses for myself. And even though I could do most things like driving a car and function and even do my eye exams because I kind of have my charts memorized, um, uh, I couldn't read well. So I found out that uh, uh, I could not do without my uh, cylinder. And uh, we'll talk about minimum amounts to prescribe uh, shortly. So I still measure about adapter to adapter and a quarter, but I refract to 2020 with uh, uh, just a, a half or three quarters of adapter of sill. So if you scope me, you're still going to find that sill in me, but, uh, but functionally.
Habib, who has a couple of books out there. Um, he has a book on uh, on uh, Robert Pepper's techniques that's uh, available through OEP. But uh, he he liked to do a lot of tracing. He would put these complex targets up on the wall and ask the person to trace with their eyes the target all the way around as if they had a pointer or pencil on it and were slowly drawing it, keeping the head still, moving the eyes. And, and um, if you have astigmatism uh, and you're undercorrected or not wearing correction, you would often see a ghost image. You'll see sort of the real image and the lighter image. We get that all the time with, with kids who have uncorrected astigmatism. They, 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 they say they have double, but it's really a ghost image. And he tells you to really, really emphasize um, the lines you're tracing and try to ignore or de-emphasize those ghost uh, lines. And eventually the lines fade as your astigmatism uh, diminishes. So uh, that's what we would find. And of course, when to prescribe um, for astigmatism. You know, there's actually no papers out there that say prescribing cylinder improves function. You can find all sorts of stuff about cylinder and acuity, but there's nothing out there that's saying prescribing cylinder actually helps the person perform better, read better, et cetera. I feel if, you know, the high amounts are really gonna blur things out, but you know, just our typical patients that come in with half, three quarters, one and a quarter, um, there's really nothing in there saying that, that any double blind studies saying that the people who had their astigmatism corrected actually performed better or read better or anything like that. Um, there, there probably are some things out there with athletes um, that uh, uh, doing doing better, but uh, uh, really couldn't find much, really couldn't find much. I did find AOA guidelines. I mentioned this last week, turning talking more about, you know, amblyopia in the very young child. So we'll just concentrate on the astigmatism here. And uh, interesting that astigmatism was, was more problematic uh, in terms of refracting lower amounts uh, to avoid a, a, a amblyopia than, than uh, myopia or hyperopia. And uh, uh, for anisometropic, uh, it, it again, uh, they said you should start correcting if there's a diopter and a half difference and still between the two eyes, you should correct. Um, and uh, which was again, more than myopia. So, so they're saying, they're saying correct, but uh, again, how much should you, how, what, what's your out? We talked last week about ouch factors. You know, how much do you leave uncorrected and how much before you prescribe? Uh, I mean, um, Dr. Steve Gallup has written huge amounts of papers on myopia, and uh, uh, we were chatting about this too. Uh, and uh, um, he, he, you really got to, you really got to be functioning poorly for him to give you cylinder. He, he thinks it's something that's a symptom of another problem, and 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 he often doesn't see any benefit to doing it. Um, so, how much you before you prescribe? Um, Easier to ignore with the rule or against the rule. We'll talk about that. Is it present at all distances? Uh, somebody actually had a question last week and this was, I said, wait till this week. Um, what happens when you see less or none on near retinoscopy as opposed to your distance retinoscopy and refraction? And of course, are they already in an, a prescription with cylinder? Again, uh, taking away sill is often tougher than taking away a uh, sphere. So uh, I said, it gets really into the body here. And to prescribe or not prescribe, this was a paper in the British Journal of Ophthalmology and uh, talked about, um, you know, when, how much cylinder do they need to have before you decide to prescribe it? So uh, for somebody very young, you had to have a pretty high amount, uh, over two, two and a half, Whereas once they were school age, people were pretty comfortable letting people walk around with under a diopter of, uh, of cylinder and uh, um, prescribing once they got to a diopter and over a diopter of, sphere, of cylinder, then they would uh, prescribe. So um, again, I think we should try to look at functional changes. And uh, let's talk, this is a quote here. 
make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. So again, you're trying to come up with a, a prescription for a patient that has a spherical and cylindrical component. And we're gonna go through some rules here. Most of these were inspired by the papers and lectures of John Streff, uh, though I've mixed in a few others. So uh, let's talk about prescribing. Uh, strive for symmetry. We do this with our spherical lenses and uh, as a rule, and, but you should also do this for your cylindrical lenses as well. Can both lenses be the same? Um, in other words, if somebody has, let's say, adapter of still in one eye and adapter and a half in the other eye, um, you know, maybe you'll trial frame adapter in both eyes and see how they do. Um, and, and they often will be, will be fine. Again, especially if they haven't been prescribed before. Um, if you can't get the both lenses to be the same, can you get the spherical equivalents to be the same? So again, now we're dealing with uh, uh, this, the, the spherical component, uh, spherical power uh, equivalent of a sphere of a cylindrical lens. Um, so again, we'll always try for the same lens in both eyes. Uh, I, I, I prescribe a lot of plus 50s and plus 75s for people who are not the same in the two eyes, because again, I'm, I'm prescribing not for acuity, but for most comfortable, stress relieving possible lens that I could come up with uh, that not allows the system to operate with the greatest degree of comfort and flexibility. So obviously if you could get them the same, great. If you can't, can spherical equivalents be the same? Um, can a spherical equivalent be plano? I do this a lot. Um, uh, often when I cut sill, if I cut a half diopter of minus sill, um, I'm adding a little bit of plus. It's as if I've added a little bit of plus to the system. So if somebody is, is plano, plano minus two, and if I make them plano minus one, 50 or, or so, I'm actually now getting their spherical equivalent a little on the plus end of things, which is gonna help somebody I, uh, in many cases, not every, you know, I don't want to say blanket statements, but if I can get some plus at near, I love my plus at near. I talked about this last week, probably about 95% of my patients leave my office with a prescription for some amount of plus for near work. Dr. Kraskin would say, why wouldn't you give plus for near? So uh, again, it depends. Uh, depends on your philosophy of prescribing plus. I really like to. So if I could get this person even a quarter into the plus end by either reducing the minus sphere or very often uh, reducing the minus sill, I think I could help this person function better. Okay. So again, we talked last week about using performance lenses to performance tests, beanbag, uh, copy forms, uh, cap ball and cap tests, walking rail to, to, to try to come up with a lens that allows them to function the best. Okay, things getting a little more complicated here. Can one meridian be at plano? Okay, so um, if you can reduce um, the sill or the sphere in one meridian or the other, you know, because remember you're dealing with two meridians here. So somebody who's plano minus two is plano in one meridian and minus two in the other meridian. And you can try to come up with a prescription where at least one meridian uh, is at plano. So again, if they're plano minus two, that's pretty easy. Um, but, and if they're minus two uh, or if they're plus two minus two, I now have one meridian that's that's at Plano. So if you could figure out a way to get one meridian at Plano, um, that would be preferable, especially if you get each eye to have one meridian at Plano. Uh, and we'll talk later on. Um, try not try to make cylinder axis at, uh, at 90 or 180. Um, again, um, even though we, 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 we love to, um, if can they if they can't be that way, can they add up to 180? So it can be at 135 and and 45, uh, and you try to get them as symmetrical as they can. So I will, even if they're several degrees off from 90 or 180, I often will prescribe 90 or 180. Um, if you if you um, 
speak to anybody who does any kind of craniosacral work. And if you work with them, they'll tell you that they can feel oblique cylinders, that it definitely causes torquing in the head and neck uh, area. And, and of course, according to Harmon, this is throughout the whole body as well. So uh, try to make cylinders at 90 or 180 if you can. Um, I'm like 85 and 92, but I wear my sill at 90 and, and I think I function very well that way. Um, if you can't make one meridian each eye plano, is it possible to have a common meridian, even if it's opposite where there is a, anisometropia? So again, somebody that has a minus two and somebody that had in one eye of sill and, 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 and minus four sill in the other eye, can you make one of those meridians? Maybe you can make the lesser sill meridian uh, and the, 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 the higher sill meridian in the eye with less astigmatism be common with the, uh, the lesser meridian in the eye with more astigmatism. So, um, you know, some of these are odd cases that you may need to pull out a pencil and paper and work out the math. But uh, uh, again, uh, and just deciding, you know, do you, do you need to prescribe this sill or not? Okay, what's the upside and the downside of prescribing the sill? Um, just because, you know, I get a lot of people who prescribe sill just because it's found on the autorefractor. I got a lot of, you know, plus two at axis 158. And it was, well, that's what the autorefractor found. And um, especially if they're, if they're oblique in both eyes, um, uh, often they see 2020 OU without the sill. So again, what's the upside of, of prescribing the sill and getting them locked in? Um, against the rule of stigmats, again, sill at 90 should be put in, uh, often need to be put into an ad as you're taking away their own built-in optical ad. So again, you're taking somebody who's not really, doesn't have a dynamic accommodative system. They're just going from one meridian to the other when they get from far to near. And when you take that away from them, it's like taking away somebody's ad. So, um, and I find um, these, these are much tougher to get people out of uh, against the rule sill than to get them out of with the rule sill. So with the rule sill, and I think this is because our alphabet is very vertically oriented, <clears throat> with the rule sill is much easier to cut or ignore. So again, if I, if I have a doctor or less, especially of with the rule astigmatism, uh, I'm, often, I'm often not prescribing it, especially for the first lens and seeing how they do. Um, you, you're gonna, again, you wanna watch what the spherical equivalent is and they, since that, since I'm cutting, if somebody's plano minus one at 180, if I, if I just, or, or plus one minus one at 180, if I just give them the plus one, um, I'm already giving them like a half diopter plus at near, and they may not require a bifocal. But the, the, the against the rule is much tougher to do. Like I said, when I took away my sill, I couldn't read. And, uh, and I found just putting in a little bit of sill enabled me to function. So you got to trial frame these, see how that goes. We're coming out to the end now, hang in there. Um, for low cylinders, can the, add, can the add power be the amount of the cylinder? So again, this works well on lower, more emerging myopes. Again, that uh, especially that low sill at 90, um, if you give them a doctor uh, of, uh, of sill, you're probably gonna wanna give them about a doctor of plus at near in the form of an add. So, um, uh, they remember how the person's operating. This is acting like an ad for them. Be careful not to overplus the patient with against the rule sill at far. Remember this is you're just playing into that meridional myopia. So um, you don't wanna do that. And uh, the against the rule um, astigmats by and large adapt to better to bifocals, especially progressives than with the rule. They're, especially if they're wearing lenses, they're already dealing with many of the similar aberrations that happen peripherally in terms of induced cylinder and, and other complex optics, which we, we don't have to get into. And the, the against the rule sill people do, do better than the with the rule. So, and progressives especially. And uh, you know, don't be afraid <clears throat> to try small amounts of low plus in cases of small amounts of with the rule. I find they generally accept it pretty well just by reducing cutting 
<clears throat> eliminating with the rule still, um, you can often squeeze another adapter of plus on top of it and they'll function pretty well. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on presbyopia, but uh, increases in sill at 90 often mean you overplussed, you overplussed them. So if you got a patient who keeps soaking up more plus, that, that means you probably, uh, that keeps uh, soaking up more sill on, on consecutive visits. Uh, watch the ad. You might not have to give them as much plus as you thought you did uh, at the onset. Uh, this is something we talked a little bit about last week. If sill drops out on near retinoscopy, and if you do near retinoscopy enough, you will start seeing this. Okay. So again, get those retina, dust those retinoscopes off. Um, even if all you have is is a, uh, a streak, open it wide, uh, and do your near retinoscopy. And if they have never worn lenses, and you're finding that the sill drops dramatically at near, can often go from two to zero. I think somebody last week had somebody who had four diopters of sill, and it went to almost none at near. Um, that means they're 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 having trouble operating at these two distances and switching back and forth and. Um, you know, those are, a lot of those cases, if I can get a plus 50 or plus 75 on them, I will. Uh, I'll even, if, uh, based on my near retinoscopy, how much plus can I get? I prescribe a lot of 37s too, by the way. So um, if acuity at near is reduced, there's more freedom to reduce or ignore the cylinder. So uh, again, if, if their acuity at near uh, is reduced, I, I have more freedom to do what I want to do. Uh, they're, they're hopefully not locked into the cylinder. And, and I will again trial frame it. And I'll see these kids go from 2040 to 2030 or 2020 with, with just a half day after plus, even not prescribing for the cylinder. Often they have accommodative issues as well. So um, they often these people with uncorrected sill, I call them lazy accommodators. They just, they just haven't had to accommodate a lot. So especially uh, against the rule, got to be very careful here. So Here's my summary. Um, astigmatism is seen in a large percentage of our population. Some studies say it might be in up to 75% if you include very small amounts. Uh, Harmon and Forrest briefly mentioned uh, functional and behavioral causes of, of cylinder. Um, Harmon's was more postural, but uh, uh, and, uh, and involving the obliques and and torquing in terms of cyclo rotations. Forrest was more into head and eye movements. Again, these are just models. Nobody has the right answer right now. Uh, and uh, John Streff developed this protocol for prescribing cylinder beyond simply cutting back. Again, I think cutting back is something if um, they have to demonstrate for me the upside of getting cylinder. If somebody has four diopters of cylinder that I measure, but the acuity stops improving after two diopters of cylinder. Is there a benefit to giving me that, giving them that extra two diopters of cylinder? And again, also one of those rules I talked about last week, I don't like to make a change of more than two diopters at a time. And it goes for cylinder also. If somebody comes in here with minus five of sill and has never worn glasses, uh, you'd really have to twist my arm to give them more than two diopters of cylinder in that first prescription. And again, I will communicate to the parent, this is the first prescription. There is a good chance this will need to be changed later on. But uh, I, really, I really find this rule works for me. Uh, and again, um, uh, I, I, you have a, a generally a patient who's gonna function pretty well and uh, um, you can make the adjustments. And if you have to bump up the cylinder, you could do it six months down the road. Uh, uh, or, or three months down the road. Just monitor and educate the parent. Uh, so there, there's a lot to be said for more than just simply cutting it back. And, and this is the big unknown. We're now, our children are now on computers um, five, six hours a day. Wow, I don't know. I, didn't, I, I would be a disaster. Uh, I, I, don't, I think I'd be out, uh, my mind would be wandering so much. It's tough for me to, to my kid, my parent, my staff is always making fun of my attention issues. So, but uh, what are we going to see? What's going to be the downside? You know, the, the, the genie is out of the bottle. Computers are here. These kids are all on Chromebooks and iPads and PCs. And 
Um, you know, we don't know when this pandemic is going to end, but the digital devices are here and they're not going to go away once the pandemic ends. What are we going to see? Are we going to start to see huge amounts of cylinders, cylinder at oblique axes, cylinder at uh, with the rule? We just don't know. And, uh, uh, but the one thing is we really need to emphasize breaks. That 20-20-20 rule doesn't work. They used, the American Optometric Association would say, take a break every 20 seconds, every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break, looking at something 20 feet away. And I'm saying, this is not enough. I want those breaks to be five minutes. I would love them to be 10 minutes. You know, this kid's on the computer for hours. What's 20 seconds here and there gonna do? Um, I, want, I want that person to get up, stretch, get a glass of water, have a snack, look outside, get outside if the weather's nice and then come back to the computer. So um, we just don't know. This is a big unknown. And uh, um, we're, we're gonna be, we don't know what's gonna be with all these school age kids now. We're getting kindergartners and kids in grade one, first grade, um, spending five, six hours on a computer. Um, I don't think it's a good thing, but again, we're here and we're the ones that are equipped to help these patients because of our unique ability to prescribe lenses and prisms and do vision therapy. So um, we're all gonna get really busy, I think. So, and that is, that is my talk. So thank you. And I'm gonna stop the share and put up the uh, chat. Okay, thank so. you so much, doctor. For such a wonderful session. So we are moving towards the second round. That is the discussion round. So I can see the one question on the chat box, doctor. Can you see it? Yes, yes, I got here. Um, this is a, a Kraskin question. After reading Kraskin's book, I'm, a, I'm assuming it's lens power in action, um, which uh, he talked about prescribing prison. Um, he, he prescribes, uh, he advocates giving a prison that's a challenge to act therapeutically. So I'm wondering if I've been using them incorrectly for years. For example, it would be convergence excess I would give base down to lift the posture up and out. But he says, give his base up. I do what you do. Again, these are, these are models and theories. Um, um, Kraskin talked about the patient in his book who he gave uh, a prism that actually like reduced their stereo acuity and, uh, and decided to give that as a therapeutic lens. Um, I do like to give base down. I will use those different directions of prisms in the therapy room. Okay, we like to go through all four directions. We go uh, base down, up, right, and left. Um, you'll hear that uh, theoretically, that's developmentally from easiest to hardest. I know I, I heard Greg Kitchener, Greg Kitchener give an iHeart VT talk on, uh, on the walking rail, and he said the same thing. So this is uh, uh, accepted in different schools of thought. But I would keep doing what you're doing, but use the prisms to challenge in the therapy room. And uh, um, I, I do think I prescribe more like you. Um, uh, and Kraskin, Kraskin gave a lot of Plano plus 75s in his book as well, regardless of whether they had cylinder or not. So any other questions? So anything, I don't know. I don't see the live stream. So I don't know if there's any other questions on the live stream. Uh, okay, I'm checking it. And okay, we are waiting for uh, here a few a few more minutes. So okay. if anybody have the question, kindly drop. Maybe I was just so thorough, nobody had questions. Okay, here's a question popped up. Is Syntonix enough to treat amblyopia with the centric fixation without using the MIT first? Uh, I mean, can we only use uh, Syntonix and VT without treating eccentric fixation uh, first? Um, yeah, I think, I think you can. Um, you really have to have an emphasis on, uh, I think Syntonix really loosens up the system. I think the MIT is a great uh, uh, activity, but very often we find if we open up the peripheral fields and do a lot of peripheral awareness and peripheral fusion activities, if anybody's ever taken um, Bob Sanit's course, uh, uh, he talks a lot about plan B 
for um, talk about two different ways to treat amblyopia. Plan A being, you know, break down the suppression and the anomalous correspondence and use do MIT and other central fixation activities to improve acuity and uh, uh, the, the amblyopia. But he also talks about plan B, which he actually prefers most of the time now, where he's working peripheral, peripheral, peripheral. And that if you get the peripheral doing really well and syntonics helps get the peripheral going, um, the fixation kind of takes care of itself. Or you may have to do real minimal amount of fixation work. So he's done that on strabs and amblyopes where he does tons and tons of peripheral activity. So um, a good question. Uh, next question, uh, can elaborate on vision therapy for uh, refractive errors? Okay, number one, you have to just, it's very, very similar to working on uh, astigmatism and myopia, very, very similar. Number one, you wanna make sure they're not over minus. And by the way, almost every contact lens patient who's over four diopters that is, I find, over minus to some degree. And that's one thing really nice about disposable lenses, especially if you're doing daily disposables, is you can make changes really quickly. So you can undercorrect somebody. And, and very often people get, people get nervous. So, so number one, you gotta start with undercorrecting. And this gets people really nervous. Um, people are afraid because the myopes initially tell them, I hate that, especially if you cut it a, my, a diopter, uh, if you call it a quarter or a half, the, my, the myope will complain, I can't see that, but it's really interesting when you cut it by like three quarters of a diopter, all of a sudden, and I think it's cause you're getting now the peripheral more involved, they don't mind it as much. You gotta try, trial, trial frame it, do it. It's really interesting that for the myope, the cutting at three quarters diopter is less bothersome than cutting it a diopter. I mean, a quarter or a half. And so, and you're gonna warn them and you're going to say, you're not going to like me the first week or two. It's gonna take you a while to get used to this new eyeglass or contact lens prescription, but try and, and hold on to your old glasses for an adult. Keep your old full correction glasses for driving. Okay, you don't wanna have an unsafe situation out. or maybe television at night. But uh, other than that, I really want you to, uh, oops, my says my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully, no, now I'm good. Okay, um, so I hope I didn't freeze up there for you guys. But uh, number one, what's the least prescription? You know, there's a, if you could get them down to 20, 40, maybe a little better, they generally do pretty well. And you do a lot, tons and tons and tons of accommodative work. Tons and tons and tons. A lot of monocular pushing the plus. How much re, how much how much uh, accommodation can you teach them to relax? How much base in work, divergence work, near far work, with an emphasis on periphery, 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 and that's what you do with these patients. And you get them up and moving. And uh, um, I mean, there's a doctor in in Washington D.C. named Emil Frankie, and he used to cut people two, three diopters. I, I don't, I've never been able to do that. I think Steve Gallup does it too, because he goes, well, of course I can. So you'd have to ask Steve or bring him back as a speaker. Um, he has, he's very opinionated about myopia because he's like a nine diopter myope himself. And, and he's, he's really studied myopia. So again, a lot, of, a lot of eye movements, eye stretches, a lot of body movements and body stretches, um, and, and a lot of accommodative work. And again, using your, um, your near retinoscopy to guide you on what's an optimal prescription. And uh, I find bifocals to be very, very handy. Again, low powered bifocals with a plus 50 or plus 75 ad. Uh, again, and always much easier to take care of things when you're uh, on the early side. Re prevention, or it's easier to work with somebody who's a low myope than a, than a high myope. Okay, let's see. We could do a whole talk on myopia reduction. Let me see. I have a patient with sudden induced cylinder of minus two, but one month later, Stig is back to a uh, usual amount. This happened to him twice. Wow, okay. That's a good case. <laughs> happened twice, almost like a marinional 
op, uh, visual uh, of meridional um, spasm, accommodative spasm. So it happens in twice. What are the causes? Uh, okay, so again, this kid, the kid probably has postural issues. He's probably way to one side or, you know, the computer's always way to the right or something like that. Um, and told me he used to close one eye to read. Well, if you listen well enough, the patient exact tells you exactly what's wrong. And if you listen well, they'll even tell you how to fix it. So um, this guy has accommodative and binocular issues. It's manifesting as astigmatism, but he's not locked into it yet. Uh, and I would get some low plus on this patient right away, like yesterday, uh, even if acuity is good. And uh, I, would, I would see how they do with that, okay? If they generally don't have it, but you need to get some low plus, something plus 50, 75, somewhere on there. Um, there's something stress reduction and they very well, if they used to close an eye to read, they might have some suppression going on and maybe need some vision therapy. So um, could be a fascinating case, um, but I, I don't think I've had a patient have like spasm induced so like that, that's an interesting, interesting case. Monitor that close, but get some, get some plus, get some plus on them. They need some plus. And here's somebody asking about their own daughter. Okay, so I won't charge you a copay here. No, just kidding. Um, my daughter had order refraction of uh, of plus two twenty five with minus four and a half sill at one eighty is a lot. Okay, She's just short of four years yet to do a cycloplegia. I think cyclo is it would be a good idea. Um, let's see. Took order refractor readings yesterday. Her dad is high sill, and I said, let's see, is it the same axis? Same axis. So that could be could be hereditary. You know, it's it's especially when it's against the rule like that. I mean, with the rule like that, uh, which you didn't use till yeah, because some of these. People are, are happy walking around. What's your take on prescribing SIL in such a case? What should be my plan? Number one, you, they, they have to have decent enough acuity to function. Um, and uh, um, it, it, obviously if they're, if they're not wearing this, I'm, I'm gonna see how well they function with a lot less. Like I said, I would go in steps. Um, I would watch the spherical equivalent and I, I would not prescribe over two diopters of sill to start, which is giving them uh, about a diopter or so of an ad at near, eh, you know, and you have, you're gonna have to trial frame this and see how this goes. And you're gonna have to play with this. And again, what's the, what's the most plus least cylindrical lens I could prescribe that gives them comfortable vision? You know, are they uncomfortable? Again, if you give them that four and a half, they're gonna, you're really gonna cause some other problems here. So. So I would be conservative, especially it's you. They're going to get a good deal on on glasses, but uh, um, but they they have some plus here, and a lot of sill, and there's definitely it's hereditary. So I mean you're not going to get them out of it, but maybe you could keep it from going up, and uh, or they might end up with this at at the end. So um, so you, you're you might be swimming upstream as we say because of the genetics here, but. You know, you don't need to give all that still. There's not a lot of benefit. You could cut it at least a diopter and, and they won't even notice at all. So, all right. So, so the answer is it depends. That's a complex case. Good case. You know, yeah, I have, I have, I have a daughter who's, you know, I feel bad because I have a daughter who's, you know, four day to my open both eyes and I wish I knew more than I knew now, but you know, it doesn't make me a bad parent. Okay. It's your business management. You prescribe bitemporal exclusion for exotropia. Um, generally, I, I will try by nasal first. I really feel again, peripheral, 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 and uh, you're de emphasizing it. Uh, I, if you don't know what they are, basically, they're you could take little rubber bands and put them just on the temporal margin of. Uh, of your corneas. And uh, Dr. Um, Sanit does it with nail polish. I'll do it. I'll put a little strip on with either a rubber band if it's just occasional, or I'll put a thin strip, just a few, two, three millimeters wide of, of scotch tape that just runs, runs just here, you know, just, just 
just on the temporal side and it's just a gentle reminder that when the eye turns out, they could use it. But that's a, that's a whole nother topic. So yeah, so size and placement. Yeah, so start with binasals first. You usually don't have to go past the inner canthus the, uh, and uh, um, just a few millimeters you know, wide. You can, some in some cases, I do go all the way out to where the, uh, uh, the cornea starts, but that's, that's really wide. <clears throat> so strabismus is a whole, whole nother ball game here. Um, so why is astigmatism not corrected? Well, sometimes it is, you know, um, often it's a very good way to go. Um, often it's a good way to go. Uh, but uh, again, most people kind of ignore it if it's adapter or less, especially if they're high on the myopic end of things. And I think this is, I think this is why there's sort of that myopic creep on, on some of these soft contact lens wearers because they're, 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 they're trying to find that circle of least confusion and uh, you get some peripheral blur, which just drives up, uh, you know, as we're learning about myopia now, you get that peripheral blur, which can just drive up the uh, uh, increase in uh, myopia. Um, so whether it increases the sill, I don't know. I'll give you an I don't know on that. So what is the role of cylinder in a patient having a squint? Should we prescribe? prescribe? Uh, again, if you can avoid, if you could get by without it, I, I really like that first prescription to not have cylinder. I, especially if they show, you know, I'll base it a lot on my near retinoscopy. If, if I get small amount on near, especially with the rule, I can usually ignore it. Um, higher amounts, tougher to ignore. Um, and, and again, uh, um, it, it really depends on the case. I, I, I ignore still a lot and, and eventually I, I, I do give it later on, uh, especially if they're, they're reading more, but I often will start with like a plus 50 or plus 75 and see if the sill comes down. But obviously once they're two or three diopters or more, then I'll look at what, how much can I cut this and still have good function, so. Good, near far peripheral activities. Oh, um, projected vectograms, if you're able to do that, or, or uh, um, doing, um, you can do some free space prism jumps, space in prism jumps. You can do um, a space fixator is a really nice free space activity where you're doing central near activities. Um, uh, you would do just a lot of central, you know, think about where you want to go before you go. Uh, can you keep that peripheral open? Can you talk about it while the child is doing basic eye rotations? Can you tell me what's going on in the background? Can you, can you, like, I have a bookcase I can see. I can see my computer monitor, though I can't see your faces. Can I keep my thumb and the computer in focus at the same time? So, um, uh, you know, just uh, a lot of uh, a lot of jump duction work uh, with an emphasis uh, emphasis on base in. So we'll do like dual vectograms. We do a lot of handheld vectograms. We have a little holder where the child is doing base in vectogram um, while looking across the room. We'll do a lot of base out base in jumps on uh, lifesaver cards or eccentric circles. Uh, okay, and and we'll do we'll do stuff like that. And uh, big emphasis, by the way. Um, if you're doing vectogram convergence work, stuff like that, really, really Brock string, vectogram, um, aperture rule, they should have some low plus on. If they have a plus lens is great, but if you have, we keep some plus 75s and plus ones around the room. You wanna make sure when you're teaching convergence that they're not using accommodation to drive the convergence. So you're just gonna make them more myopic. So, um, so make sure when you're doing a lot of activities where you're pushing, uh, base out convergence at near that you're wearing some plus just to, to avoid them becoming more ESO and more myopic. So, um, so hopefully those are some. Mirror superimposition, but that's just a, a different activity, but uh, um, okay, excellent. I think, I think we're good. Those are some, you guys are very deep thinkers. I, I'm very impressed with the, um, the 
quality of questions, which means I think you guys are, are hope I, I'm expecting to be practicing at a very high level. And uh, it's been a pleasure for me to share my knowledge. I, I'm not smarter than anybody. I've just made all the mistakes already. So, and, uh, <laughs> and I've had some good mentors. I learned a lot from, from Dr. Streff, but I've learned from Dr. Kathy Stern. I've learned from uh, Dr. Martin Birnbaum. Uh, and uh, and some others, uh, some really good. Brenda Montalcalvo and Kelly Knippel are, are friends of mine that I've learned a lot from as well. So um, the great thing about vision therapy is we get to learn all through the rest of our lives and uh, um, keep it up, keep up the good work. Okay. okay, thank you so much, doctor. I guess we have answered all these questions. So we are about to end of the today's session. Still, mm -hmm. if you have uh, any question, you can unmute yourself. Dr. Fox will be happy to talk with you if you have any queries. Mm -hmm. So very good, excellent. So I know it's late there. <laughs> <laughs> it's All nighttime right. there. Yes, so. doctor. Okay, doctor. So. Uh, if you have any good notes before ending the today session? No, just that, that like I said, um, trial frame things. Um, the, the, somebody, one of my mentors was uh, um, Dr. Ira Schwartz in, in the state of Connecticut. He was a physicist. So he probably knew more about optics than anybody I ever knew. And he could cure all these strabs and amblyopes just with lenses. And uh, he used to say, you know, just, just prescribe, you know, you don't be afraid, just prescribe the lens. The worst that'll happen is you give the kid a headache and you have to change the lens, okay? But, but you gotta get over this fear of, you know, being afraid to prescribe something a little unusual, you know, cutting the sill by, by two diopters, um, putting some base down prism in on, on an esotrope, uh, different things. You just, you just gotta just do it. You know, there's that Nike TV commercial, just do it. If, if it doesn't work, you change the lens. You're going to eat a little glass, as we say, but, but you'll be surprised at how quickly you get really good at this and prescribing becomes second nature. And, you know, um, and, and you just got to not be, not be afraid. You know, the, the great thing about our profession, we really can't do much damage to our, to our patients um, if, you, if you're conservative on your prescribing and your, your examining. So just do it. And thank you, thank you so much for having me. This has been, this has been a huge pleasure. I look forward to our paths crossing again. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's a pleasure, a pleasure to us as well. So, and we'd love to see you again in our conference. So yeah, our team is gonna be GMU very soon, and we'll be, we hope that we will meet on our conference. So thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Be well. Stay healthy. You too. Have a good day, Doc. So here with I announce the close of today's session. Hope to you see uh, see all again in next class. Thank you so much. <laughs>